same as their parents' income per year after adjusting for inflation. So by that measure, the children of the rich are not any richer than their parents. Meanwhile, if you look at the data for children who grew up in the poorest of households in the late 1960s and early 1970s, by the year 2000, 82% had higher real income than their parents. Not only a little higher, their median real income was double that of their parents. This is really incredible. And it's evidence that the possibility of upward mobility in the United States is still very real. Now these facts do not discount the real problem and difficulties still faced by those who are poor. But they do suggest there have been more improvements for the poor in the last 40 years than many people believe. To continue those improvements, we should seek ways to expand opportunities for income growth and with it, greater absolute mobility for those across the income distribution. Okay, get your answer to that question down, and then I'll collect those here in a minute. Did not turn one in? I need all the papers in the next 10 seconds, otherwise no credit. Good? All right. So, Jesse, number between uh, three and seven. Changes in income, changes in quintile. Riches, rich kids stay the same, poor kids get richer. Okay, uh, you want to add on to that a little bit more? I think we could say a little bit more. You're a little brief with your description here. Uh, let's start with the changes in income, changes in quintile. So they move into a different quintile over time. I think that's part of what you're missing here is that's kind of a key aspect of this. When we do income inequality stuff, it is at a point in time, right? We're taking a particular year and looking at the distribution of income in that year. One, two, three, four, five, six. Chase, where are you? All right, Chase says, the movement five margins of household from the rich to the poor making uh, drastic yeah. drastic changes over the years as richer don't always get rich and the poor don't always get poor get poorer so you're talking about uh, that you're not stuck in that category right so that, that's kind of the essence of it is is how much to what extent, if there is, in, um, given the income inequality that exists today, um, in our economy, would we expect it to be sticky? So 
Um, having traveled to India three times, they still kind of suffer from what's called the class system. And so you're kind of born into this class and you're stuck with that class, right, it, it, historically. And they've kind of banished that system, but still culturally there's, uh, there's, there's things there. And so uh, income mobility is this thought that, hey, you might have been born rich or born poor, but does that mean you're guaranteed to stay there, right? Uh, what kind of opportunities uh, do you have in the country that you live in? And so here in the United States, um, here's some of the information as presented in your text. So 87 to 2007, and in 87, what this is saying is that the highest quintile, uh, we had 48% of those people who were in the highest stayed in the highest, right? So 48% stayed in the highest, which means that 52% moved. So over half of the people who were in the highest quintile that we talked about yesterday were in a different quintile uh, by the time 2007. So that's quite a few years, 20 years um, after 20 years. Some of them even went to the lowest quintile. But if you add up all three of those, there was movement that direction. What about the people who were the lowest quintile in 87? Five per, only 5% five stayed in the lowest quintile, and the rest moved up. I'm sorry, I, I said that backwards. I thought that didn't seem right. 42% stayed in the lowest quintile, but 58% roughly moved into other quintiles. So that's the type of movement that uh, the data is showing over time, over this 20 year time frame. So, there is a bit of stickiness that if you're rich, you tend to stay rich. We're at 48%, but at the same time, there's movement. And of course, you can look at all of this data to kind of see the different uh, uh, shuffling that goes on. Okay, any questions or comments on that? Yeah, Jesse. I just noticed something in the video. It mentions that the children of poor families would go on to make double their family's income earlier in the video and said it was only around 8,000 to begin with. So they're still at poverty, but we're just making 16,000. No, if they doubled, they were using real purchasing power numbers. Uh, so that jumped them into the next quintile, I think is what they were uh, saying for that statistic, if I remember right from the video. So it was real purchasing power, not just uh, uh, absolute terms, not adjusting for inflation. Okay, so let's see, another part here. Uh, 2008, so we were right before it, right before it. Okay, so yesterday we did the 90-10 business. What was the 90-10? You have it in your notes, look, look, look back. The 90-10 ratio, what were we dividing by what? See it? 90 by 10, but what was the 90 part? It was 90 divided by 10, but it wasn't actually, that wasn't our math. What was the 90 thing? What was the 90 thing? The 90th percentile. Good, the 90th percentile. So these are our higher income people divided by our 10th percentile, which would be the lower income, real low, not even quintiles, right? So the lowest bottom 10% and looked at the spending that's done by the 90th, because uh, we're trying to probably rule out like LeBron James and stuff, right? We don't want to include the yachts that he's spending his money on. So that's part of the reason they picked the 90th and the 10th, so that we got a little bit of breathing room both directions. And so what this is pointing out is that if we look at the inequality with expenditures, uh, the inequality is less. So that number is almost six here and a little over three. And this was from 1984 all the way through 2014. And inequality, the gap between those two has actually changed. Expenditure inequality has actually remained more cons constant than the income inequality number that has grown a little bit. And so part of that was due to consumption smoothing. What was consumption smoothing from yesterday of what people can do if we take that into account? What was consumption for the day? Loan. Loan, yeah. So being able to basically borrow against your future income. So if you're a young college grad, 
you can do some borrowing to pump up your expenditures today and then pay for them tomorrow as your income grows. So you're smoothing your consumption over time. All right, so that was another way to look at um, inequality. <clears throat> now, this next one is dealing with poverty. So poverty is a little bit different than looking at the lowest quintile. So the poverty level is um, set by um, some economists and other people uh, as a group to look at the consumption levels uh, to be considered poor for certain government programs. So they're kind of looking at you know, minimal levels of spending to get by so that you would qualify maybe for the food stamps or other sorts of assistance programs. And so um, in 2020, and this is similar to what it is now, it's a little higher probably, I can't remember for sure, but 26,200, that's for a family of four. So a family of four, that's not getting you to first base, right? If you've got a seven-year-old and a, and a two-year-old and mom and dad, family of four, 26,200 is the poverty level of income. And so it uh, um, is the level that is used often so that we can kind of compare things over time. Has the poverty level gone up? Has the poverty level gone down? And so that's what this next table looks like is how poverty has changed over time. So here is the number of poor families that were in poverty according to how they measured it, which was again back to kind of purchasing power and all that, 1959, 1976. And so we had a 8%, uh, 5.3, 2011, 9, and dropped to 7.5. That's for everyone. And then we can go do some breakdowns here. Um, <clears throat> percent of the poor families headed by a female, African American, elderly person, person who worked at least some during the year. So those are some of the statistics we can think about as we look at those people who are in poverty or meeting the poverty, uh, below the poverty line is another way to look at it. So poverty rate in the United States. So 18% versus 9%. So has poverty, has the rate of poverty improved or worsened over this period of time from 1959 to 2018? Poverty rate is better or worse? What does that mean here? We got 18.5% in 1959 versus 9.7% in 2018. Better, right? So we want the number to be lower. How does that differ from the number of families? So up here, it looks like we're not doing very good, right? It was eight, here where it went down, that was kind of nice. And here it went down relative to here, so that's kind of nice. But the poverty rate looks a lot different. 18, 10, 11, 9.7. What rate are we talking about? What, how do we get a rate or a percentage? What are we taking that as a, as a percent of? rate of change of how many more people fell into poverty from one year to the next? What do you think that's a, what would that, what would be relevant statistic to say 18 and a half percent of people are in poverty today? 18 percent of what? Yeah, Tim? Of all the people, yeah, of the population. So here they're doing it as a population so the fraction, have we made some improvements in terms of the number of people as a fraction of the population? Yes. What's happening to the population in the United States from 59 through 2018? Growing or shrinking? Growing. So yes, it's possible that this number is pretty flat, 
this number is pretty flat. The absolute number of families in poverty is fairly flat. But if the population is growing, then the percentage of the population is shrinking if that one's flat and the population is growing. You guys with me on that? Okay, so then we can look at married couples and female headed households and the races and go through the rest of the list there. Okay, um, any questions or comments there? Yeah. So it's double the rate, yes. So it, it does lead you to think that, well, what's, what's going on here? Why is that the case? Um, one of the statistics that's not on here is that two-thirds of the, let me speak to the race question first, two-thirds of the people in poverty are white. So this is the fraction of the black population that is in poverty. And so that has was 55%, and so we see a similar trend going down, but yet we have maintained above it. And then with women, what did you say, female-headed? Yeah. yeah, so female-headed families, um, we're talking uh, uh, single-family households. And so that has uh, also been improving over time, but still a bigger gap. So in terms of your, you know, Wondering why they're double, I don't know. Anything else? Okay. But there might be, if you want to research it, there's probably some economists that have uh, tackled that. I just don't know where that would be. Okay, so, um, so one of the issues we face with po fighting poverty is the, uh, the uh, what do we call it? not the fiscal cliff, but it's kind of similar. Uh, he might even mention it up there and draw a blank. Okay. But it's this, it's this problem of people getting out of poverty when you start to make, so let's, let's say you're in poverty and you're getting some assistance, right? So you got food stamps, you got uh, utility assistance and, and some income assistance of some sort. And so you're living on uh, $20,000, somewhere in between 20 and 30. And you're like, man, I really want to get out of poverty. I want to go find a job. And so as you start to find a job, what happens is some of your benefits go away, right? An extra $10,000 means your food stamp payment goes down and your utility assistance goes down and your income assistance goes down. Well, what does that mean for the person? In the worst case scenario, it would be 100%. So imagine that as I earned an extra $10,000, I lost the money, the extra 10 I made was 10,000 of lost assistance programs. See what I'm saying? Does that give you much incentive to work, the extra 10,000? No, it's an effective tax, an implicit tax of 100%. You work an eight hour day, make an extra $10,000, and the $10,000 is all gone away, not in the form of taxes, but lost assistance. You see what I'm saying? So that's why we call it an implicit tax. It's an implicit tax that's built in because of the loss of assistance programs. And so this is a problem that's faced of getting people out of poverty is that the incentive to work um, isn't, isn't as strong as it would be for somebody that's out of poverty. And so we have this thing starting to fall as you start to make more money. So that's called the fiscal something. I can't remember, what, not fiscal something, it's a cliff. Sorry, I cannot remember, but it's kind of a, just a, you know, people are very aware who study poverty of the, of, the, of the cliff effect. Okay, questions or comments there? All right, let's see. Um, the last thing I wanted to show, this is towards the tail end of the chapter, is uh, the earned income tax credit. So uh, this has been around, it's on the books now. It's probably one of the more successful ways to help the poor uh, because it doesn't have the, the same 
uh, effect as that cliff, as other programs do. And so the idea is, if you go to work, you're going to get a tax credit, uh, which can be tied to your number of children <coughs> and, uh, and yourself. And so in theory, you could have a negative income tax. Would that be bad? For the person, for the recipient. No. No. I, I'd love to pay a negative income tax, right? So what does it mean? Well, for each, let's say, uh, I'll just kind of make up some numbers. Let's say you, uh, uh, you earn $10,000 working at Taco Bell. Um, one of the things of this program uh, that some people have some contention with, but it, it's, it's trying to address the problems of the cliff, um, is that... Uh, you do need to work. You have to have some earned income in order to... Maddie? Oh, okay, that's your laptop. Gotcha, all right. All I saw was from here, Lazar's uh, thing was there, so you're good, you're good. Okay, so uh, you have to have some earned income to do it. But you get, let's say, 5000 per person, just to make up a number. So you get two kids and yourself, and you get a an income credit of $15,000. I make $10,000 and I get a $15,000 tax credit, which means Uncle Sam sends you a check in the mail for $5,000. You with me? So that is the earned income tax credit and uh, it addresses, it's kind of a, a bipartisan uh, type of effort that uh, was a way to get people with additional money, but uh, they also have to go have some sort of job to be eligible for the credit. And so that's had some traction. Everything always has some uh, bugaboos do it, but uh, that one has been uh, relatively successful. Okay, any last questions or comments? Let's do some review. Okay, so now before I go too far forward, um, I want you to make sure you know this last week, the income inequality and the last one is not on your final test. Because to me, that wouldn't be fair. Right? So, uh, you do have your normal week eight stuff, Saturday, Sunday, like usual, but that is just the week eight stuff. So, um, what we're gonna have for the test is um, from weeks basically five through seven. All right, so here we go. We started off with the cost. And so we broke down cost into implicit and explicit costs. And so the formula that you should kind of hang your hat on here is that total cost can be broke down into total variable cost and total fixed cost. Fixed costs do not vary with quantity and variable costs do. So we have a whole bunch of things that kind of fell out of that with the shutdown point and other things. And then we found it useful as we move through the chapters to take the average total cost. So to get the average total cost, we divide by quantity. And the average total cost is now equal to the sum of the average variable cost and average fixed cost. So this is one of my favorites here that it kind of, this everything in this rectangle there's about five formulas wrapped up into one. You've got the total cost, average cost formula, this one, this one, this one, and this one, all in one spot. The most important one though is missing. The most important one is the marginal cost. The marginal cost is the change in total cost from a change in quantity. So now I'm thinking about an extra bushel of corn, an extra basket of chicken wings, an extra six pack of beer. What is the cost of an additional unit? 
We can also look at the change in variable cost if we don't have the total cost numbers. I'll kind of put this over here. Fixed costs don't change because I think that's helpful. So we can delete that part following from this formula and we get the marginal cost only change by variable cost changing. So you can use this formula or this formula as you think about marginal cost. All right, so then graphically, we've got a bowl shaped average total cost, a bowl shaped, and then it approaches vertically the average variable cost. And then both of these bottom out. This one bottoms out before this one bottoms out. And we got a marginal cost curve that comes through the minimum points. Just to be clear, marginal cost is total cost minus fixed cost. No. Total cost minus the fixed cost is the variable cost. You use this formula. Yes. I'm just trying to figure out marginal cost because it's just variable cost. It's the only way total cost changes is by this one changing. This one never changes. Yes. So you can use either way. It, depending on what, if a problem only gave you variable cost, then you'd want to use this one. If the problem only gave you total cost, you'd want to use this one. Either one's going to get you to the same spot. See me after class for more questions. All right, so here's our basic cost structure where the marginal cost curve has to cut through the minimum. That was our GPA example, right? So when you're... Uh, GPA is a 2.7 and your overall GPA is a 3.0, your overall is going to come down after that gets added into it, right? So that's why we have to cut through these minimum points was part of the way it has to work for the relationship between marginal cost and average total cost and average variable cost. All right, so that's the graph. And then we had stuff like the shutdown point, the shutdown point, which basically meant produce quantity equal to zero when price is less than average variable cost. We have to be covering our variable cost in order to justify staying open. So this is then we kind of got the insight of why does why does price chopper close at 10 p.m. Why don't they just stay open 24 hours a day? They're not covering their variable cost. In some other big cities, they might have enough volume of people coming through, and so they're open 24 hours a day. So that's our shutdown point. <laughs> Sorry, it's getting a little funky there. Shutdown point. <laughs> We had stuff like economies of scale. Economies of scale was a situation in the long run where an increase in the scale of production led to a decrease in long run average total cost. So this was an insight as to why do we have these big corporations in the United States, or at least one of the reasons that we might see big companies out there, that those particular industries might have large economies of scale, and so they naturally gravitate towards there being bigger and bigger companies, which might involve companies merging with each other and all of that stuff. Okay, so the short run was a period of time which something's fixed. Period of time uh, something, at least one thing, is fixed. And this creates fixed cost.
When we say something like the long run, everything can vary. All resources can vary, which means there are no fixed costs. No fixed cost. Okay, so any questions or comments so far? All right, so now we move into our four market structures. So after the cost chapter, we want to apply what's going on. Uh, let me do one more thing, I guess, on profits here. So economic profit was defined. Economic profit <clears throat> includes both implicit and explicit costs. Therefore, that leads us to the idea that economic profits equal to zero is okay. They'd like to make more, but if we're including all opportunity costs, economic profits is okay. Right? And we called it a normal profit. The company's earning a normal profit. All right, so perfect competition. We've got to hang our hats on the three characteristics. So one, we got a large number of sellers. Two, we have a homogeneous product. They're all selling the same thing. <coughs> And number three, free entry and exit, which is a long run concept that gets us some results that are desirable, one of them being the normal profits. So the model sets up two things because our firm is a price taker. So we're gonna put the firm with little q here, the representative firm, Bomber or Ted or whatever. What does number two say? I'm sorry. Homogeneous quantity, homogeneous product. I put a q there. So we got the market here with some old supply and demand curve. We got home base, this was chapter three. So to the left, we got the market price of soybeans or something is at $8. And thousands of sellers are producing millions of bushels of soybeans. And the market price from the Chicago Board of Trade shows soybeans selling at $8. So the representative farmer over here is a price taker at $8. At the market price, <clears throat> the firm has no market power which means the demand for their particular soybeans is perfectly elastic and equal to $8, which also means that the revenue generated by producing another bushel of soybeans is also $8. So the demand curve is the marginal revenue curve in a perfectly competitive environment. Farmer Ted here can't escape the law of diminishing returns which also fell out of this chapter here too. And so all firms maximize profits by producing the quantity where the revenue generated by the last unit is equal to the cost of the last unit. So they're gonna produce that quantity. In the long run, due to free entry and exit, we predict that any excess profits would go away. 
We'd also predict that any economic losses, if times are tough, will also go away due to firms leaving, going out of business and exiting. So through free entry and exit, we get the prediction that in the long run, the average total cost will be just kissing that point because that reflects economic profits equal to zero. So what I've drawn here is the long run equilibrium. And in the long run, one of our conclusions was that profits are going to be zero, which implies price equals average total cost. dynamic process of it evolving over time. We did cars on corn in class, as you review your notes. So we have uh, returns to scale. Returns to scale. We have three cases, constant, <coughs> increasing, With constant returns to scale, as the industry got bigger, as there was entry into the industry, entry led to no change in the average total cost. With increasing returns to scale, entry led to an increase in average total cost. In this case, entry <coughs> led to a decrease in average total cost. So those are the three cases we covered in class. That are There's lots more details in your notes to review, but that's the gist of it. And dynamically, it went something like this. Suppose this market, we learn how to make uh, our soybeans save lives, reduces cancer or something. So we got the market for soybeans, edamame is the game changer, and there's an increase in demand. The increase in demand raises the price which of course our farmers love. So their demand went up, they increased the quantity that they're supplying, and now they're making economic profit. That was the short run. What do profits do? If there's positive profits, enter, enter, enter. And so when that entry occurs, if we're in a constant cost industry, the increase in supply due to the entry will cause us to fall right back to our long run equilibrium of economic profits equal to zero. And so we're gonna get right back to where we were before, except that we'll now be at a new intersection. There's a demand curve here that I need two golf clubs today. There's a demand curve there and a supply curve there. We'll get back to $8. If we were in an increasing cost industry, then as the soybean market grew, it drove up, let's say the price of fertilizer, just to make up a story or something. So then as the industry starts to expand, the cost of production start to rise. And if they start to rise, then we're gonna to return to a long run equilibrium at a higher price in this market permanently, if the increase in cost was there. 
Now, if those costs change over time, then that could be changing. In a decreasing cost industry, as the entry happens, imagine that um, the, uh, let's just go back to fertilizer. Fertilizer actually falls because there's economies of scale in fertilizer production. If that's the case, and fertilizer is an important input, then as the entry occurs and prices start to fall, average cost actually falls as the industry expands, which causes the long run price of soybeans to actually be permanently lower than where we started. So those are the three cases that kind of get us to different spots in the long run, all dependent upon how the resource market, which we just came out of this chapter, and the output market are interrelated, right? How do they work together? So this probably, I hope this makes a little more sense now that we've gone through some of the other stuff that we can kind of think about the resource market and the demand for resources, the demand for fertilizer, uh, whatever, that those kind of are working here to give us different results in a competitive market where the long run price could be falling or increasing. Certainly um, uh, the uh, electronics, uh, phones and TVs and all of that stuff, the tech equipment has been a decreasing cost industry. Right? So as the industry expand and innovation occurs, uh, they've been able to make uh, stuff relatively cheaper over time. Okay, let's move into monopolistic competition. A lot monopolistic competition, I'll just write comp, monopolistic <laughs> competition, introduced the idea of a differentiated product. So the change from perfect competition is a differentiated product. Now we have fast food hamburgers that look a little different, but at the end of the day, they're still a hamburger. They're just differentiated. With a differentiated product, but still low barriers to entry, the monopoly or the the, the firm in monopolistic competition faces a downward sloping demand curve. But due to free entry and exit, there's a lot of good substitutes for their product, and so we drew the demand curve fairly flat in a monopolistic comp in monopolistic competition. Why? Because if Burger King raises their hamburger by 25 cents, I'm just gonna walk across the street to Wendy's and McDonald's, right? There's lots of good substitutes for the hamburgers. And so that means consumers are very responsive, right? Very elastic, very flat. They're very responsive to price changes because of the availability of substitutes. With the downward sloping demand curve, the marginal revenue curve lies below it and is twice as steep. And so when it's really flat, it looks like this, being twice the slope, but it's pretty flat. I probably even made that one too steep for that matter, but nobody can escape the law of diminishing returns. That's a strong law in economics, which then gives rise to the law of increasing cost our J-shaped marginal cost curve. All firms maximize profits by producing the quantity where the revenue generated by the last unit is equal to the cost of the last unit. Do you think there's a good chance that might be on the final? Yeah. There's a good chance anyway, yeah. All right, so quantity, they're gonna charge the highest price people are willing and able to pay. But there's not much margin like, we, like we'll see in Monopoly because of the elastic demand. And so the price they're gonna charge is here. But free entry and exit means we're still gonna have this prediction. The same prediction we had for competition, for perfect competition, will remain because if McDonald's is really knocking it out of the park with this hamburger invention, then other people are going to cut into those profits, right? And so they're going to keep entering as long as there's abnormal profits, profits above zero, above normal, 
then they're going to enter. And so this one, you guys might want to watch me again. So the trick is you got to kiss this point and then you got to bottom out here. So you kind of got to do a real flat one. Just kiss minimum up. Doesn't have to be perfect, but in theory, that's the price and the average total cost is there at the minimum anyway. So this point as usual is still the minimum of the average total cost, but our result is price equal to average total cost, meaning zero economic profit. So when price equals average total cost, if we use our profit formula, price minus average total cost, the difference between price and average total cost times quantity, when price equals average total cost, that means we get a big fat zero. Zero economic profit in this competitive environment with a differentiated product and low to no barriers to entry. I'll just go ahead. All right. I'm thinking my answer is no, but go ahead. I don't want to catch up. Yeah, okay. Here. See me after class. Yeah. All right. So we've got here price discrimination in this chapter. So price discrimination was charging different prices to different people for the same good. So different prices to different people for the same good. And we learned that this turns to help out poor people and college students a little more than it does rich people. We're actually charging rich people more and allowing uh, other uh, consumers to do it. So charging different prices to different people for the same good and so to get that, with price discrimination, we need different consumers, different consumer elasticities of demand. So the high income people would have a different demand than the low income people, for instance. We need to separate the groups legally, like no students allowed, or you guys will like this one better, student discount, 20%. And then lastly, there can't be no any resale, no resale, or it's very hard to resell. If we do that, then our price discrimination is not gonna work because the smart college kid is gonna buy it for 20% off and sell it to somebody else. And then you basically are selling more of your product at a 20% discount than what you had planned on, right? If they're selling it to the higher paying people. Okay, so we see this going on all over the place with all kinds of products that we went through, but those are the, those are the basics for it. All right, then we move into high barriers to entry. So monopoly, uh, by the way, this was long run over here when I show zero economic profit. I, I said it, but it might be good. Let's put parentheses long run equilibrium. Where there's zero profits, that's our long run prediction. There could be short run profits in any of these. But what is the adjustment over time is what we typically focus on. So with a monopoly now, of course, one seller. That's our big difference. Why do we have one seller? Actually, our big difference is the barriers to entry. So we spent a lot of time thinking about what causes people to not be able to enter into an industry. So is there high cost of entry, special resources, um, government uh, protection, government granted monopoly, uh, all kinds of stuff, different regulations that make it uh, costly to enter the market, that sort of thing. 
So with a monopoly model, we have a downward sloping demand curve that's a lot steeper. So just kind of draw some sort of regular old demand curve. Remember the demand curve is showing the willingness to pay by people. This is back to chapter three. So the demand curve is the marginal benefit curve. So just because you have a monopoly doesn't mean they can charge any price. Like they can't charge $100 for their product if it's a $8 hamburger or something, right? So eventually they, have, they still have to kind of, uh, let's just say cater to the wishes of what people want. Nobody's forced to buy it. We're still under voluntary exchange. They offer it for sale. These people choose whether they wanna buy it. Which also means though that to sell additional units, they have to drop their price. That's our law of demand. The marginal revenue curve will lie below it twice as steep. Even the monopolist cannot escape the law of diminishing returns. All companies maximize profits by producing the quantity where the revenue generated by the last unit is equal to the cost of the last unit. So the monopolist is going to produce that quantity. They're going to charge this price. And then with this monopoly power, because there's barriers to entry, however you got that, we'd expect this company to be profitable, right? You should be making some abnormally high profits uh, if you've got some barriers to entry. And so we have an average total cost curve. You can put it wherever you want, as long as it's below. And so at this quantity being produced, the average total cost is lower than the price, giving us economic profits of that rectangle. So this is, again, the long run equilibrium over some period of time. Again, we kind of learned that there isn't any monopolies that have really stood the test of time as far as private companies go. The US government has maintained their monopoly on US currency pretty well. So that's because they can make the law and uh, make themselves the only provider of uh, American dollars and American money. Is that not a good thing? How can we have to pass? All right, so here, we, I gotta stay focused on the review. I hope you appreciate that, right? Yeah. All right, so uh, here's the economic profits. And what does that signal? Enter, enter, enter. But why don't they go away? They make it Barriers to enter. So. There's barriers to entry, so yes, the signal's on. Like everybody knows that this company is really profitable, but they can't enter the market to grab on to kind of you know challenge the incumbent firm because of the barriers to entry. All right. So our last one in our barriers to entry chapter is oligopoly. So oligopoly is a few sellers and barriers to entry. So oligopoly. Oh yeah, it looks like I got a little extra fun in here. O L I Oligopoly. So, what happens when we have a few sellers? Well, we kind of shifted gears here. The primary way we model uh, oligopoly is through strategic behavior. And so we had our game theory hat on. Ooh, under, I heard that hit for a while. All right, so we've got, uh, 
you know, Tesla and General Motors. And they're trying to decide on, you know, the entry into a new market. So enter, uh, enter Canada, where batteries freezing is more of a problem than the United States, uh, or don't. And GM is thinking maybe some new technology. I'm just making this up, of course. Enter Canada or don't. Okay, so now what I'm about to do is not gonna make any sense possibly with the thing, but it's a technique that you guys can use to practice on your own, and that's what I'm gonna show you. What's kind of fun with this is you can just make up numbers and then solve the game. So I'm just, you can write what I do, or you, yeah, you probably wanna write what I do just to do it, but let's say this is, I don't know, 140, 65, 86, 34, 77, 110, 69, and I don't know why I'm hesitating. I just can't even think of a number. I just totally made up those numbers, right? So you can just kind of make up numbers in the whole thing, and then you can try to solve the game, like if these were the actual payoffs. And so we had two techniques to kind of start solving. We can look for a dominant strategy or we can look for a Nash equilibrium. So the dominant strategy technique is to say, if Tesla chooses to enter, then what should GM do, right? And so now you kind of come over here, so you're wearing your GM hat and GM's trying to decide what they do. Well, let's hypothetically say that Tesla enters. Since 65 is bigger than 34, then it would be more profitable for GM to enter. So GM would enter. If hypothetically Tesla did not enter, so now we're down here, what should, Tes or what should GM do if Tesla doesn't enter? 110 is greater than 69, so I should not enter. Don't enter. Therefore, GM has no dominant strategies. A dominant strategy is a choice that would make you better off no matter what the other person chooses. All right, we do the same thing for Tesla. I'm not going to write it on the board, but. Real quick here, if GM enters, Tesla should enter. 140 is bigger than 94. If GM does not enter, Tesla should enter. So what does that mean? Does Tesla have a dominant strategy or not? Yes, enter. So without writing it all out, I'll just put a note and you guys can prove it to yourself. Tesla has dominant strategy of enter. Now, GM knows that too. So if GM knows that Tesla is going to enter because they have a dominant strategy, then it's clear for GM that GM should enter and both enter. So we already know that this is where we're going to go, but is it a Nash equilibrium? Well, it turns out it's going to be. Tesla wouldn't switch, GM wouldn't switch, that makes it a Nash equilibrium. If there's two Nash equilibriums, they're on the diagonal, 77, would Tesla like to switch? Yes, so it's not a Nash equilibrium. So the only Nash equilibrium, turns out that's why we use the dominant strategy, is that one. So the other technique is Nash equilibrium. And so at enter, 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 enter is a Nash equilibrium.
Okay, so that's our game theory. Uh, brought us into like cheating and other things too, incentives to cheat. So we're kind of looking at firms' incentives through their payoffs. So strategic behavior is kind of the name of the game. So let's just put that as another note. We covered incentive to cheat on a agreement with the cartel model. So that was more of a supply and demand approach that we did. You guys can check in your notes. So we had Kuwait and Saudi Arabia and the world price of oil was so high and their marginal cost was low. So on paper, it's like, hey, we can have an agreement and we all act together like a monopoly and we all make lots of money. But what we found over time is that because of the incentives, each firm, each individual has incentive to cheat and they cheat. And so uh, that leads uh, to some different outcomes than what they were maybe desiring. All right, um, resource market. So with the resource market, we have the resource, which we often use labor just because it's um, easier, it's, it's an important resource, the largest one in most uh, firms as far as the expense, not all of them, but so the labor and the wage. So we got the price and quantity of labor, could be measured in hours, could be measured in people number of people needed and we ended up having the firm with a demand for labor that's downward sloping they don't want to pay this person for the tenth person they'd only pay him two bucks now the second person they pay 20. And so we might start thinking, why is that? Is it because of all the things we went through with the inequality and discrimination and so on and so forth? Um, but this result comes about from the profit system and the law of diminishing marginal product. Nothing against the 10th person. And in fact, if the 10th person was actually my second person, I would have paid them 20, right? I don't really care. I just need a person to do the job, right? So this is just talking about the law of diminishing marginal product. As you add more and more people, the productivity of the additional people starts to fall. So that was our key insight into the demand. So the demand equaled the uh, marginal revenue product, the MRP. And so the demand or the willingness to pay, so the MRP is the willingness to pay people. It's their demand. The amount the company can pay the maximum, I should say, the maximum that they can pay is the revenue that they generate for the company. And so the formula we went through was this, and this was the extra money, the change in revenue. So our formula was the change in revenue from more hamburgers And here was the change in hamburgers from the 10th person or the second person or the 13th person. And so it's nothing against the person. In fact, if that particular person again was second in line rather than 10th in line, it's really just falling out of the law of diminishing marginal product. 
So the reason the demand curve is downward sloping is due to the law of diminishing marginal product. All right, so how many people do we hire? Let's say that the labor market is such that you can hire as many workers as you want at $15 an hour, which isn't too different from our actual situation. So the supply of workers for a low, no skill job is the marginal cost to the company. Can hire another person for 15 bucks. You want another person? 15 bucks, 15 bucks, 15 bucks, right? You can hire as many workers as you want. So how many workers should they hire? Hire the number of workers where the cost of the last worker hired is equal to the revenue generated by that worker. And so this is the profit maximizing amount of people to hire for my company. I should be hiring 100 people. Nothing against the 101st person that doesn't work for me, but because of the law of diminishing marginal product, the 101st person is costing me 15, but only generating $14 of revenue. That doesn't make sense for the profit maximizer to hire that person. Just to be sure we that scale that we like, we just use Oh, sorry, yeah, I, I did kind of do that on you, didn't I? So yeah, if you want to just change this to five, that's probably the best thing to do if I want to clean this up. Thanks, Tim. Okay. So then there were some other things we went through. This is the stuff that's more fresh in your heads and fresh in your notes. So it looks like a good spot to wrap up for today, unless there's any last questions. And you can see me after class, 